The second resource we need to worry about is space. That's the memory of your computer. So time is a limited resource because we're only around for so long. So we only want to wait for so long for our computer to run whatever program it's running. Space is a different sort of resource in that your computer tends to have only so much space available. And when you run out, then your program will crash. So we do need to think about how much space we're using up, how much memory we're using up inside the computer when we compute things. So let's talk about the consumption of space. Space is taken up by objects, but also by frames. So every time you call a function, you add a new frame, starting a new environment. And so far in the course, we've seen that you can accumulate many frames by calling functions over and over again, especially recursive functions. So we need to concern ourselves with which frames we really need to keep around and which frames we can recycle as the course of the program proceeds. So here's the question, which environment frames do we need to keep around during evaluation? Each step of evaluation has a set of active environments, one for each function call that hasn't completed yet. So the values and frames in active environments consume memory because they're active. There's still work to be done in that environment, so we can't get rid of its frames. Memory used for other values and frames of functions that have already returned, well, that memory can be recycled or reused again. So every, even though we draw lots of frames, when a function returns, we don't usually need that frame anymore, unless it's active. So active frames are ones that are for function calls that are currently being evaluated, meaning those functions haven't returned yet. There's another case where a frame can be active. If it's a parent environment of a function that's still accessible, so it's still named in an active environment, then we need to keep that environment around too. So active environments are the ones that start with frame for functions that haven't returned yet, as well as for the parent environments of all the functions in those active environments. So let's see how we can visualize that. And let's define a function fib, which if n is 1 returns 0. If n is 2 returns 1 and otherwise returns the sum of fib n minus 2 and fib n minus 1. Okay, so we can compute Fibonacci numbers. If you remember from last lecture, fib 6 builds a tree with 15 elements. So if we visualize the execution of fib 6, we see that fib is called with n is 6, and then we make the two recursive calls, one for n is 4, and then eventually we'll make the one for n is 5, but not until this returns. Okay, so we do some work in order to have that return. And then down here, we've called fib on 5. And if we run the code forward for a while, we'll find that we've computed most of fib 5. It hasn't returned yet, but a lot of the pieces along the way have returned. So we're almost finished. We're at one of the leaves of the tree there, and if we go a little bit farther, we'll find that we returned 5 for fib 6, and now we're back in the global frame. And here's all the frames that we created along the way. Should be 15 of them. But by the time we get back here, none of these frames have any effect anymore. So we don't need to keep them around. We only keep them around in order to see what happened, not to see what's going on now. But there's an option in the online Python tutor. Don't display exited functions. So that means don't display anything that we don't really need to keep around in memory anymore. As a result, you get a more accurate picture of the memory that's actually used by a program. Because now we're only going to keep around active environments. So the global frame is always active, because we're always going to have to go back to the global frame. When I call fib6, this environment that we've just created is going to stay active until we return, which is going to be some time from now.
But notice that as I proceed, I have created several frames along the way, and yet I don't need to keep them around. So just now, I completed the call to fib4, and the return value is 2. So we know that this recursive call gave us back 2 in our original fib6 call. And now we have to compute this one. But we don't need the frame for this anymore. All we need to do is remember that 2 was computed. I'm going to add something to it by making a call to fib5 which I do here, which as you can see, uses up some more memory, but not that much, because at any given time, there are only so many active calls. Now, fib5 returns three, and when that returns, we don't need this frame anymore. So we're done with that frame, and now we're done with that frame, and now we don't have any memory usage at all. So what's really going on here? Well, here's just a depiction of all of the different calls that I make when I compute fib6. And here are their return values at the leaves. Now, assume we've reached this step. So we've computed all this stuff already. The only things that are active are those calls on the path from where we are to the root of the tree. Because everything in red is already returned. So these have an active environment. The stuff that's red can be reclaimed because we already returned from those function calls. We already got their values. We don't need to keep the frames around. And what about the stuff in green? Well, we just haven't gotten there yet. So we don't need that either. So if we're just computing Fibonacci numbers with this recursive formulation, all we need to do is keep the frames that are active in the call chain that gets us to the recurrent call.